Greetings, physics enthusiasts. We are continuing in unit four of AP Physics One. This is lesson two. So you remember that in lesson one, we learned the work energy theorem. So please allow me to review that because it's very important. The work energy theorem. And the work energy theorem says, briefly, it says the work done is equal to the change in kinetic energy. <clears throat> Hence, work energy theorem. Now, work is just the word we use to describe force times distance. Now, sometimes, you know, Object A does work, and object B does work, and object C does work, and all of them do work on object D. So when I say work, it's always implied whether or not I write this, the network. And therefore F, well, it may be that object A and object B and object C are all pushing on object D. So this F is not any one of those forces, but F always means the net force. So again, work means force times distance. And then you'll remember that change, delta, is always a final value, might, so that's a little f, a final value minus an initial value. So delta always means the final value minus the initial value. And what is kinetic energy? It's 1 half mv squared. So whatever 1 half mv squared was at the end minus whatever 1 half mv squared was at the beginning. And of course, one half doesn't change and m doesn't change, but so one half m the final squared minus one half m the initial squared. So either of those can be the work energy theorem. They're the same thing. And this is helpful because if I know its initial speed and its mass, and I know how hard I'm going to push it and how far I'm going to push it, I can predict its final speed. And that's really helpful. If I've got this coffee cup and it's moving along and then I'm going to push it to speed it up, if I know its initial speed and how hard I push it and how far I push it, I can predict its final speed. Similarly, if it's moving along and I push it this way, then that's going to slow it down. Notice that if these two, force and distance, if these two are in the same direction, positive times positive is positive. Negative times negative is also positive. So if the force and the direction of motion are the same, if it's moving to the right and I push it to the right, that speeds it up. If it's moving to the left and I push it to the left, that speeds it up. Force and displacement, same direction, speeds it up. Therefore, the final kinetic energy will be large. The initial kinetic energy will be small. If they're in opposite directions, it's moving to the right, but I push it left. Or it's moving to the left and I push it right. Well, then this left side is a negative number. And the only way I can get the right side to be negative is if I subtract something big. One half is positive, M is positive, and something squared is also positive. So this is a positive number, this is a positive number. The only way to have positive minus positive be negative is if this second number is bigger than the first one. In other words, the initial kinetic energy is large, the final kinetic energy is small, meaning it's going fast. I push it the other direction. It slows down. Now, I went over all that really quickly, partially because it's a review from last time and partially because you can put it on pause and if, as you go back and watch it again and see if that all makes sense. Okay. Uh, I'm making a tiny note to myself. All right, so let's put this uh, to use. Let's do something practical with this. What if there's a ball sitting on top of a shelf? I know I'm a terrible artist, but so this represents a shelf and here's the ground and the ball is sitting up there on the top of the shelf. And so the ball is at rest. So its initial speed is zero, the initial is zero. And therefore, 
1 half m v initial squared, since v initial is zero, is also zero. Its original kinetic energy is zero. Now, let's say that somebody just taps the ball, it moves just a little bit over here to the right, and it falls down, falls down, falls down. What's going to happen to the ball as it falls? It's going to faster, it's going to speed up, and its kinetic energy is going to get bigger, 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 bigger. And so what we might be interested in is one half m v final squared. We might be interested in v final, what's the final speed, but we also might be interested in what's the final energy, one half m v final squared. One way of looking at that is via kinematics. We did a lot of that already. We could use the kinematic equation like uh, v final squared equals v initial squared plus 2ax or we could use V final equals V initial plus AT. Some way we could look at uh, a kinematic equation and find the final velocity, and then use that to find the final kinetic energy, or we could look at our work energy there. So when the ball is over here, when it's no longer sitting on the shelf, who is pushing on the ball? There's only one answer to that question. Earth pushes ball down. Right, so this arrow represents the force. Earth pushes ball. I'm sorry, there's a little bit. I, I cleaned my barbecue over the weekend. I'm just being a little annoyed because I can. Right, I need to clean. Right, sorry. Um, okay, so Earth pushes ball down. How hard? M G. While Earth pushes the ball down, what direction is the ball moving? In this particular example, down. So, the velocity's direction is down and the force's direction is down. And therefore, the force and the distance are in the same direction. And therefore, their product is positive. Even if you want to call the down direction negative, a negative velocity, um, uh, a negative force. And of course, not only is the velocity down and is the force pointing down, but x, our displacement, or d, is also down. So if I want to do force times distance, Negative times negative is positive. I'm doing positive work. And the big idea that we just talked about is that positive work speeds stuff up. When I do positive work, when I push the same direction we're moving, the thing goes faster. Mm. Now, work is force times distance. How hard does Earth push? Mg. How far does Earth push? I'm going to call this distance h to indicate that it's a height we're moving up and down. So this is how hard Earth pushes, mg. This is how far Earth pushes, h. And therefore, this quantity mgh is how much work earth is going to do on the ball while it falls down so if i plug into my work energy theorem work equals delta ke the work that earth is gonna do on the ball is mgh and it's a positive amount of work that we're going to do in this particular case m is positive g is 9.8 h and I'm like, oh, but H, we're moving down. Shouldn't that be a negative number? No, because I already said this distance is probably negative, but this force points down and it's also negative and negative times negative is positive. So all these numbers are positive. And that's going to give me a positive change in my kinetic energy. One half mv final squared minus one half mv initial squared. And again, for this very, very specific example that I'm showing you, the initial was zero. So if I know the mass of the object and G and H and one half, oh my goodness, wait a minute. I can even cancel out mass again, only for this specific example. I could find the final velocity really easily. The final velocity is equal to the square root of two GH. So using this work 
energy theorem, I didn't have to struggle too much to find how fast the object's going to be going when it hits the ground. Are there people who memorize this formula? Yes, there are. Am I one of those people? No, I honestly do not have this memorized. And I don't expect you to have it memorized either. I want you to remember the work energy theorem and plug in. Because sometimes there will be different situations. What if the original speed wasn't zero? Well, then I wouldn't have been able to cross this out, but I could have put a number in there and still found the final velocity. So that's how we use the work energy theorem. Now, what I want to tell you is that there are more things with names. Remember this product, force times distance, that got a name. It's called work. And this product, one half times mass times velocity squared, that gets a name. That's called kinetic energy. Well, it turns out that this product, mass times 9.8 times height, we use that a lot in this chapter. And so we're going to give it a name as well. And I'll tell you the name in a minute. But what is MGH? MGH is the work done by Earth. It's how hard Earth pushes MG times how far Earth pushes H. And remember, how hard you push times how far you push is work. Work is force times distance. Now, when the ball is sitting up here, its velocity is zero. Its kinetic energy is zero. But it's in this very precarious position where any moment it could fall. And so we are going to use a word that references something that is almost about to happen. You know what that word is? That word is called potential. Teenagers have the potential to be productive adults. You're not that yet, but you're gonna be. You're just right on the cliff. We just have to push you over the edge and then you become a productive adult. So what we call this MGH is potential energy, energy, potential energy. This it doesn't have any energy, it's not moving, but we see it as potential energy because any moment earth could do positive work on it. So I think of MGH or potential energy as the work that Earth is going to do in just a moment. There's a word for in just a moment. It's called imminent. I-M-M-I-N-E-N-T. Imminent means going to happen really soon. Um, imminent sounds like in a minute. Mm. So imminent means the same thing as potential. Maybe we could call this imminent energy. Maybe if I, if I got to name things, I would probably call it imminent energy, in a minute energy. It's the work Earth is going to do on the object in a minute, soon, potentially. Okay, that's enough about MGH, potential energy, for now. We will talk lots more about potential energy and kinetic energy as we work our way through this chapter. All right. Uh, so the other thing I want to show you, so this is topic two for this video. I'm just looking at how much time we have. Oh, we're doing great on time. I want to show you a graph because we just love graphs in physics. Uh, we love graphs in math class. We love graphs everywhere. I also love a pen. It's not out of it. So here's my vertical axis. Oh, good gracious. How many, how many big pens can one man have? Okay, horizontal and vertical axes. I am going to graph force on my vertical axis and position on my horizontal axis. Of course, whenever, uh, whenever I have different axes, I want to give those uh, labels a unit. Position is measured in meters. Force is measured in newtons. 
And so this graph is very, very, very important. It's called a force versus position graph. And let's say I push an object, get my coffee cup, and I push it with a force of five newtons, five newtons, five newtons, five newtons, five newtons. Five newtons. So I can have, you know, one, two, three, four, five. And I'm going to push it with that force of five newtons for 10 meters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Sorry, those aren't evenly spaced, but you'll forgive me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten meters. How much work did I do on the coffee cup if I push it with a force of five newtons? with a force of five newtons or 10 meters. Well, work is force times distance, right? So work equals force times distance. I pushed with a force of five newtons for a distance of 10 meters. So I did 50 joules of work, 50 newton meters of work, 50 kilograms times meters per second squared of work. Um, and so 50 joules, that's how much work I did, woohoo. Not very exciting. But what you might be noticing is, hey, there is a rectangle here of length 10 and height 5. And the area of the rectangle is also 50 Newton meters. Hmm. And that turns out to be a relationship that always holds true. That Area, area equals work done. Now we call this the area under the curve. This is not really a curve, it's a segment. So, mm. and, and then under, well, isn't this also under it? Well, yes. So I just wanna make it clear. The, the phrase that we use in math and science for what I've just drawn here is area under the curve. What that really means, what does area under the curve mean? Area under the curve means area between the graph and the horizontal axis. So, but that becomes really important later because what if I made a different graph? What if I, what if while we moved uh, 10 meters to the right, I pushed the thing to the left. I pushed with a force of two Newtons to the left. Well, that two Newtons would be down here. And then the work done would be five times two is, uh, five times two is 10. That would be negative work. What does negative work do? It slows things down. So if we remember from our math class that this is quadrant one, and this is quadrant two, and this is quadrant three, and this is quadrant four, whenever the area is in quadrant three or four below the horizontal axis, that's negative work. So that's one thing that's important. Let me draw another graph. What if I exert a force that changes? Oh my goodness. What if I start out exerting a force of zero, but the farther I move, the harder I decide to push. I push harder, 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 harder. That's kind of like a spring. Maybe you're, you um, have, have looked at at springs, some springs hold garage doors in place. Some springs work as shock absorbers. Um, but you know, it's not very hard to pull that spring at the beginning, but the farther you pull it, the harder it is. So you're exerting an increasing force. So again, force measured in Newtons, position measured in meters, always label axes. Then if this is what I did, I have this area. Oh. Because if I were to say force times distance, notice that the force keeps changing. The force keeps increasing. Which force would I use? Oh, so now this area is still the work done. So much easier. I just have to calculate that area. What's the area of a triangle? One half base times height. I hope you remember that. What if I had this really 
interesting graph. What if the force measured in Newton versus position measured in meters, what if the force changed like a sine graph? Oh my goodness. How would I calculate that area? Well, regardless, once I calculate the area, that area is the work done, the area between the curve and the horizontal axis. What if that sine graph continued? Then this would be negative area. And as I go from here to here, the total work done would be zero. Positive area plus negative area equals zero. Now, I'm not going to talk to you right now about how to calculate that area, but I am going to suggest that Isaac Newton, who did a lot of physics, invented a whole branch of mathematics to calculate these areas. That's right. Newton, and they're called integrals. Newton invented calculus, A, because it's just fun. The calculus is fun for itself. But he was motivated to invent calculus in order to solve physics problems, because Newton was a physicist. Yes. Yes. So that is that. I'm going to show you one more tiny thing, and then I'm going to be done. Tiny, fast, simple. I just want to go back to Newton's third law. Do you remember Newton's third law? Of course you do. We studied it very recently. What if I graph here, force measured in Newtons, position measured in meters. What if I graph here, A pushes B? And I don't even know, you know what these numbers are, but green is A pushes B. If A pushes B, can you tell me what B pushes A looks like? Can you? Of course, because B pushes A just as hard as A pushes B, but the opposite direction. So the graph should look, let's see if I can do this. Like that. So that's the graph of B pushes A. And it's just so beautiful. Look at that symmetry. This is the work A does on B. A does positive work on B. So A is speeding B up. And B does negative work on A. And what that shows is that if A does work on B, A does positive work on B, where did that energy come from? It came from the fact that B did negative work on A. A loses energy, B gains energy. And this is gonna lead us to something we'll study later in this chapter called conservation of energy. All right, that's all I have for you today. Feel free to watch again. Have a lovely day.